So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media interview, broadcast and recorded live on blogtalkradio.com from the new media and baseball capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Frank Miller must have a guardian angel. How else to explain that in the days before his latest movie, The Spirit, would premiere to horrendous reviews, it was announced that his next project would be a remake of Buck Rogers. I think in Hollywood they call that falling upwards. Anyway, even wilder is that Dave Gibbons, co-creator of the greatest graphic novel ever, Watchmen, wanted to re-team with Miller to bring their comics creation, Martha Washington, to the silver, to the silver screen. It was just the kind of distracting good news Miller's career may need with the spirit likely headed for an armload of Razzies come award time. Dave Gibbons is my guest today, and Frank Miller and Martha Washington are just the latest developments in a career that is set to go into warp drive this spring with the release of the film version of Watchmen, likely to hit your local cinema very soon. Here's uh, uh, an audio trailer. Here's the audio from the trailer, uh, the movie Watchmen. That sounds cool, and you haven't seen the trailer, you'll be blown away by seeing it at WatchmanMovie.com. The coming attractions of Watchmen are causing the kind of buzz that the original Superman movie did, you know, where they said, you'll believe a man can fly. Uh, it just looks that good. And then, of course, there's Dave's new coffee table-sized book, Watching the Watchmen, a collection of notes, sketches, and scribblings he accumulated during the creation of Watchmen. They include contributions from Watchmen co-creator and writer Alan Moore, editors, and others. If you love Watchmen, you'll have to own this book. Dave Gibbons, welcome to Mr. Media. Hi, Bob. Good to be here. Good to hear your voice. How, it's been a while. How are you? I think it has, yeah. We, we were last talking, I think, about uh, Will Eisner in the spirit. So there's a weird kind of synchronicity going on there, isn't there? It is a little. Yeah, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about the, the, uh, the kind of circular nature of things, but you're right. Yeah. Oh, there's, there's always a circle of nature where Watchmen's involved. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess you're not going to have much luck making uh, uh, 2009 a uh, quiet year for you, are you? 
No, I think it's it's shaping up to be a pretty busy year, actually. Um, I think uh, we start at the, the kind of end of January, and then I think we steam on through the uh, springtime, straight on into the summer. But, uh, you know, the wind looks set fair, so I'm really looking forward to it. So, you know, where should we start today? Uh, should we talk about the new the new book, the the original uh, graphic novel uh, for Watchmen, uh, the movie, which should we talk about Martha Washington? I'm going to do something I don't usually do and ask you, what would you like to talk about first? <laughs> well, I suppose we could be really boring and just kind of go in chronological order, couldn't we? But uh, let's just dip in there and, and pull one out. Let's talk about the uh, watching the Watchmen. I had a feeling you might say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm under strict orders from my publisher to talk about that uh, in preference to everything else, obviously. Well, I will, uh, I will help. And for our, our friends in the, uh, the live web chat that uh, accompany uh, the live Mr. Media interview, uh, I am going to give them a spot where they can even order the book while they listen to you talk. They so, won't be able uh, to resist, Bob. They won't be able no, to resist. I, how can how can you resist? You, I know. <laughs> this is such a spectacular book. It's a great peek behind the scenes at the making of a, if you don't mind the term, comic book classic, graphic novel classic. Mm -hmm. um, how long how long have you thought about publishing this material? Well, I, I mean, what what really happened was I'd, I'd hung on to all this stuff because uh, you know I had to keep it close at hand and in some kind of order to actually draw the book and I don't mind the term comic book I'm as happy with that as I am with the term graphic novel I, I, I like the term big fat comic book you know that seems to cover <laughs> all the bases to me um, but I kind of kept all this stuff in, in reasonable order and then it went in a drawer in a filing cabinet and just kind of stayed there and I was vaguely aware that I still had it but when the, the movie looked like becoming a reality in one of the discussions I was having with uh, Paul Levitt's up at DC, I, I mentioned that I had this stuff and I thought it would, you know, could make an interesting book. It's certainly the kind of book that as a fan, I've got um, shelves full of. And, and knowing that Paul as a fan is, is, is probably the same, um, I wasn't surprised when he, uh, he very quickly wrote a note in his uh, notebook. And um, then I inventoried everything and had found I had much more than, than I remembered. Uh, then I demanded that we have Chip Kid design it, which uh, Chip was fortunately very happy to do, and uh, so we we had a book. Well, that wraps it up. <laughs> it's it, it's uh, it's interesting. One of my uh, favorite lines is actually right up front, and I know it's there for a reason. There's a a page that kind of begins the book uh, where you reprint uh, uh, what looks like a, a typewritten page from uh, Alan Moore. And he's kind of describing uh, what this will be about, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Charlton, Charlton Comics characters. Uh, but what I loved, which seemed to really capture Alan, was at the bottom here is uh, talking, talking about how the public would respond in, in, the, in the comic book, within a real-life comic book world, how would they respond uh, to real life superheroes, would there be a, a sudden blossoming of crank religious groups who worship superheroes? How would the media <laughs> respond to such an attractive and presentable image? Would they try to buy the rights from superheroes to the <laughs> manufacture of dolls and lunchboxes in the image? I thought well, well. now that that sounds like now you know I, I thanks to you I, I got to interview Alan for the uh, the Eisner book uh, several years ago. Oh yeah, yeah but that that one little uh, snippet sounds like everyone's impression of the things that Alan would be thinking about if, if there was a real-life superhero world. Yeah, I mean, you know, that was one of the main things about the book, was to, was to you know, try and investigate that if superheroes really did exist. And, you know, how would the world be changed? I mean, in all the years, the decades of Superman comics, the, you know, the world hasn't been materially changed by the presence of Superman, other than on a monthly basis, the world is threatened and Superman saves it. But nobody seems to particularly be changed by the fact that there is this creature with godlike powers. And I think that was at the center of what um, Alan wanted to do was to investigate how the world itself would be changed. Uh, and that was kind of key to my thinking about it as well. You know, when I realized that actually this wasn't a superhero comic book within the usual confines of um, a, a superhero world, but this was actually a science fiction book. This was actually an alternate reality book, you know, about a world where 
um, that there was a godlike super being and there were other costume characters running around. And once I started to think about it like that, um, you know, it really changed my approach to it. And I didn't try to emulate superhero comic books at all, but I just, if I tried to emulate anything, it was a sort of a, um, a quasi documentary on um, an alternate world. Uh, I want to let uh, listeners know you can call in and talk to Dave, ask him a question, uh, drool about Watchmen or something else. Uh, give us a call, uh, 646-595-3135. I think Dave and his publisher, uh, Titan Books, would be particularly pleased if you <laughs> mentioned his new book, Watching the Watchmen. Um, did, did, did you remember things about the creation of the book uh, from putting this material together that maybe you had kind of set aside or didn't seem important before? Um, well, it's strange, you know, because over the years I've been questioned a lot about Watchmen, and I, you know, one or two of the stories in here are fairly well honed and and and, and pointed, but um, you know, there were things about remembering my old uh, my old house and the guy who had bought it off me, you know, mm-hmm. phoning me up to say that he had uh, he, he he had a box of comic books if I wanted to come and get them and. I went to pick them up and it was Watchmen number one. And I said, oh, great, it's, this, it's printed copies of this new comic that I've been working on. Would, would you like one? As I opened the box and he said, well, not really, Dave. I don't really read comics. And I said, well, just have, have one anyway. Here, look, I've got 50 of them. And then the next month he phoned me up. He said, oh, Dave, there's another box of comics for you. So I went and got them and didn't even bother to open the box. And as I walked down the, the path, he said, oh, Dave, could I have one? I, I, I want to see what happens in issue two. So, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that to me was, was really interesting because this was somebody, a complete, in comic book terms, civilian who, had, who, who, who professed no interest in comic books at all, had been sufficiently intrigued that he wanted to see what happened next, which, of course, is what all storytellers want, is, is for the, the listener to want to know what happens next. So, um, yeah, I mean, there were things like that, that that I was really interested to record. And obviously there were there were odd details that popped out, you know, just as I started to really concentrate on it. And uh, when I really started to think about the first time I met Alan, that started to come rather vividly alive to me. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, um, it's, it's, it's probably everything that I could think of. Um, in the context of this book, I mean, there are other stories, as I mentioned at the end of the book. You know, there have been elements of, of controversy um, um, around Watchmen. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not trying to hush those up, but this particular book is a celebration of a, a really great creative time that Alan and I had. Uh, and perhaps uh, what happened ultimately um, is a tale for another for another volume. Well, I, uh, I want to come back in a moment uh, to the... Uh the story of how you first met Alan, which you mentioned, but uh, we have a call. I want to go ahead and get them on. Okay. Uh, hi, do you have a, a question or comment for uh, Dave Gibbons? Dave Gibbons. Yes, I do. I have a question regarding the new Fox lawsuit and them now apparently owning the distribution rights to the film. Um, how do you think this will impact the um, release of the film in March? Um, well, you know, first of all, I have to say that I'm not a lawyer, and no doubt there are, and I certainly know nothing about um, American copyright law or about American legal documents appertaining to the motion picture business, but it just seems to me that it really isn't in anybody's interest for the movie not to come out in March. I mean, all the publicity has been aimed towards that. That's when it will get the, the, the maximum exposure. That's when the maximum return on the investment is likely to be made. And I imagine um, that Fox would rather have um, have some money than just spoil the whole thing. So I can't really see that it's in anybody's interest for it not to come out there. And I, I just suppose that it will entail, you know, fevered discussions behind locked doors amongst entertainment lawyers. All right, thank you. Okay. Thanks for your call. Thank I, you. I, I, I'm going to follow up this question. I, I uh, and I was going to come to this later. Uh, watching the suit uh, unfold, I thought the timing was 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 perfect from Fox's point of view. They waited until the movie was completely done. They waited until it was screened at uh, uh, Comic Con, and there was incredible buzz. Obviously, there's there's a huge amount of interest 
And then they dropped the suit because it was it, it's at that point pre-release where it's worth more than it will ever be again. Mm. And, uh, you know, you have to, I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I, I, again, I'm, I'm a bit of an ingenue as far as the movie business is, is concerned, but it certainly seems that there are some very sharp minds and possibly sharp teeth out there. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I really don't know what went on behind closed doors, but I just have to agree with you that certainly Fox's timing um, is um, immaculate. <laughs> even, I mean, if, you know, even if, even if, the, no, I'll just leave it at that. Their, their timing is immaculate. Well, they do seem to be in it for uh, for the money, and certainly the timing to make mm. money off of it was perfect. Now, Ned. so yeah, there'll be some. Uh, you would have. I, I don't know. I, I would be. I would be very surprised if they could not reach some agreement uh, to keep this on time because it's. It, I mean, listen. Interest. It's 22 years, 23 years by the time the movie comes out since the uh, Watchmen was originally published. We, we we know that interest is only going to build. So even if it's delayed a few months, it's not like people are not going to want to see it. The the trailer is so spectacular. That well, that's to- true. I mean, I suppose the worst case scenario that I've had, uh, you know, read people agonizing about on the internet is that somehow Fox get control of it and cut it down to a to a 90 minute pg feature but i think that is paranoia really i i mean I, I you know i have no inside information about this at all but if i was a betting man um i would say that this movie is going to be in the in the theaters on march the 6th as advertised although of course uh, i suppose rather ironically we now have a a ticking clock um you know, a, a, a kind of a doomsday scenario of a different kind but uh, <laughs> you know my feeling is that things will get um worked out even if not to everybody's satisfaction I, as i say i can't see that anybody uh, would want this movie not to come out on time in all truth mm. well we'll come back to the movie in a few minutes and i want to say that we we uh, we have a phone line available if you'd like to call in and get in a question or comment with uh dave gibbons who's uh, got his uh, new coffee table book watching the watchman give us a call 646-595-3135 Three five. Uh, you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago that uh, working on the book brought back memories of the first time that you met Alan Moore. Uh, mm-hmm. Can you tell us about that? Well, yeah, it was it was kind of um, at the um, in the early days, I suppose, of, of, of um, kind of not, not not really the early days of British fandom, but the the first wave of really organised conventions, which I suppose had started around the early 70s. So by the time uh, it got to the kind of late 80s, uh, you know, there was quite a movement in Britain, and um, Marvel Comics were were still, you know, um, a a big presence um, in the British comics publishing field. And they actually organised a convention at a most inappropriate venue, which was this horticultural hall, which was a... Yeah, more or less a big greenhouse as I remember it with this hall at the side that had a stage with steps going up to it and they put all us artists um, at our signing tables on this stage so that in order to come up and get an autograph or a sketch you had to kind of walk up this steps these steps towards these kind of thrones at the top you know which considering we'd we'd, you know people like me had only really been working professionally for a year or two made us feel really like we were something you know something special um and i remember that amongst those you know trudging up these steps was um was a friend of mine called steve moore who uh you know was of my generation of the first real generation of fans that had broken into british comics and he was a writer and worked on the editorial uh, team of uh, one of the British comics. And um, he he had a, f- a friend with him, t- a tall guy with l- loads of hair, a beard, uh, a rather tightly fitting three-piece suit. And he had a big plastic carrier bag, which was, you know, weighed down with comic books. And... Um, um, and Steve said to me, um, oh, Dave, um, I, I'd like to meet a friend of mine. This is um, Alan Moore, uh, no relation. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I remember shaking Alan by the hand and having a brief conversation with him. I mean, at that point, Alan was not working professionally in comics as such, although he'd had stuff published in the underground press and the music press. And we exchanged a few words. And, and that was it probably for 
oh, you know, the best part of a year, I would think, before our paths really crossed again. But the phrase that stuck in my mind was this, you know, Alan Moore, no relation. So, uh, <laughs> so you know, we've been through a few things together, but uh, that's still kind of how I, I think of Alan, no relation. Um, okay. And, uh, I, I mean, it's, it's a strange coincidence as well that, that even to this day, uh, Alan is still very good friends with Steve. I mean, I think Steve is, is, is in a sense, Alan's, mentor and, and helped him a lot when he was starting out and they're still cl- collaborating on stuff to this day and um yeah you know the uh more brothers no relation <laughs> i was gonna say <laughs> and still to this day no relation absolutely well as far as i know <laughs> <laughs> now uh alan has this uh uh i, I want to say i don't know if i want to say this reputation but i mean he's a he's an imposing guy i know uh, when you had arranged for me to interview him, I was a little, I, you know, it was one of those times where I was actually a little intimidated going in, going into it because he, he has such a strong reputation for strong opinions. That I, my sense is that he's a, a take no crap kind of guy, uh, but he turned out to be just uh, delightful. He was very witty. He answered questions. Uh, we had a wonderful chat. Um, did he seem imposing on that first meeting? Did he, you know? Well, I suppose kind of physically, given his, his height and the amount of, of, of hair flying around, he was certainly a notable character. But you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, Alan is a man of, of strong opinions and isn't, isn't afraid to express them. Um, but in person, he is, um, you know, a very affable character. He's very warm, very friendly, um, lo- loves, loves to chat. Is always solicitous about one's 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 health and so on, and, and I mean he's just he is just a really nice guy. I mean I think the fact that he he keeps himself a little aloof from um, you know comic fandom in, in in general, and again given the kind of m- mobbing and you know kind of Beatlemania level hysteria that he had to put up with when he did present himself at comic conventions, I I really don't blame him for for standing back from it, but. I think it's that kind of lack of visibility coupled with the, well, you know, with his creative genius. And I don't think that's an, that's an, an overstatement, you know, that, that makes people think that he is some, this kind of, you know, God, godlike figure who, who, who rarely steps down to mortal earth. And, but he is, you know, <laughs> as they say, he's just, just this guy. I mean, I've got memories of being sat around his house and having these deep discussions about the, fifth dimension and and uh, conjuring up demons from beyond and uh you know all, all kinds of uh, rather out there stuff and then 10 minutes later being in the vegetarian section of the local supermarket buying something for dinner you know so um <laughs> uh, i mean he does exist on one level on this uh, very creative intellectual plane but you know he he's he, he's a guy the same as the rest of us and he happens to be a very nice guy I saw that. Are you asked more uh, on a general basis? Are you are you asked more about Watchmen or about Alan? I think I'm asked more about uh, Watchmen, but yeah, I mean, in, in some senses, as you discovered, I am one of the conduits to Alan. You know, I mean, he he he, he doesn't publicise his, his phone number, obviously, and he hasn't got a presence on the internet or email or anything like that. So he's rather a difficult guy to get hold of again mainly because a lot of people want to put a part to him and a lot of people you know are just curious about him so um yeah i mean i do you know get asked the what was it like to, to work with alan moore you know and i get asked to speculate on what his uh, his thoughts on things might be which is a temptation that i always resist because i haven't usually got a clue particularly what his <laughs> thoughts are going to be about anything um so yeah i mean i do get asked that but um What's rather strange with Watchmen is that for a long time, because uh, apart from anything else, it's journalistic shorthand, and I think a misunderstanding of the medium uh, to call it, you know, Alan Moore's Watchmen, um, and that's never particularly upset me because Alan himself has always been scrupulous in giving me my due credit. It used to upset members of my family, you know, my mum and my wife used to get a bit annoyed that that my name was never mentioned, but of course. Because Alan's now requested that he, 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 his name isn't on the movie or anything to do with the movie, you know, it's almost kind of becoming 
Dave Gibbons Watchman. So, <laughs> you know, um, perhaps this is uh, perhaps this, this is this is my time in the <laughs> Watchman Sun. And uh, you know, again, by the same token, I, I'm I'm always very scrupulous to give Alan the credit he deserves, which is immense. Um, mm-hmm. But um, I, I think maybe some people now are not even aware that Alan Moore had anything to do with that. <laughs> well, and I want to ask you. Um, uh, I want to ask you a question. I'm, I am going to ask you a, a question about what Alan might be thinking, and I think you'll be able to answer <laughs> this one. But uh, I want to say uh, we've got a call waiting, and I will get to the call in a minute. And there's also a question uh, from the web chat. So I'm going to ask you this question, then we'll move on to those. Um, what, what, if anything, has Alan's response to uh, you publishing this book been? Uh, knowing that he's not, well, knowing, getting the, the sense that. He's not the biggest fan of these commercial spin-offs of, of uh, products, as he kind of hints in the opening page to watching The Watchmen. Yeah, well, um, well, his response to this is, I, I mean, basically, when I knew I was going to do the book, um, I phoned him up and told him that I was going to do it and, and asked him if I could use some of the material that he was personally responsible for uh, and he was c- quite happy for me to do that as long as I didn't reproduce his script in 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 great volume which is why I don't know um to my taste you know there's perhaps too little of his script in it I would like to have seen a little bit more um and um you know he did say to me during the course of me writing it because we spoke about other watchman related stuff that he was actually, um, you know, indifferent to the movie and everything to do with it, and really always happy to talk to me, but didn't want to talk about Watchmen anymore. So I really didn't talk to him at all in the course of writing it. But I did send him a copy once, uh, once I'd received some, um, and um, I haven't heard back from him about that. Although I must tell you that uh, last week I did get a Christmas card from him, so it seems that we are. Still friends, and I, was, I was, I, and I was very scrupulous with watching The Watchmen that it only talked about the comic book. You know, it doesn't go into the movie. It doesn't go into anything else that spins off from the movie. I'd always intended it to be, you know, just about the creation of the, the comic book. You know, the kind of the real beginning of it all. And also, I suppose, in a slightly duplicitous way, but I hope an honourable way, um, it did seem apt to me. To, to, to do it for the reason that you know the the, the credit that might have been uh, not given to Alan in view of his absence from the movie would be given to him very very fully in watching The Watchmen that hopefully lots of people who who were interested in the movie would buy um, so you know I, it, it was my chance to make it really clear who did what way back when irrespective of what's happening now. Mm. Well, the book, the wonderful thing about the book is, and this is why I called it kind of a behind the scenes peek. I mean, you get to see the characters in development. You see, I'm mean, looking at, uh, you know, a crumpled up page, for example, with character sketches. And, and uh, yeah, I love, I, I think most comic fans love to see pencil sketches and, mm. and uh, concept uh, uh, sketches. Uh, let's go to our uh, telephone line, and I'll remind people you can call in and talk to Dave, 646. 646- Five nine five three one three five and uh, hi, you have a, a question or a comment for uh, Dave Gibbons. Um, as soon as the phone, there we go. Dave. Hi, go ahead. Hello. Hi, am I on? Yes, you're on. Okay, uh, in the online community, many people have expressed their opinion that you and Alan Moore intended to make Adrian Veidt the ultimate hero of Watchmen. What is your opinion of Veidt? Um, is he the hero of Watchmen? I, 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 um, I don't think that what, you know, if, if Watchmen has got a hero, it certainly isn't Adrian Veidt to my mind. I, I mean, I guess, you know, in some ways, uh, Dan Dryberg is the everyman, you know, the guy who has to wrestle with it all. And, um, you know, I think the one that a lot of readers identify with is probably doing what they would do in those circumstances. But I suppose if there, if there is really a hero, despite the fact that he's he's uh, he's a nut, I, I think you know Rorschach has to be the hero. He's the one who ultimately, you know, doesn't compromise. The one who ultimately, um, you know, fights his corner and never gives in. So I would think that he would be the hero of it. I I can't really see in any way 
that Adrian Veidt is. You know, um, externally to the to the people in the world of Watchmen, he appears to be a hero, and that position seems to be maintained. Although, again, as you know, it, it's very ambiguous at the end as to what's going to happen. But uh, no, it wasn't ever our intention to make him the hero. Thank you. Is, it, is that the answer? It is. I appreciate <laughs> that a great deal because. Um, there's been a lot of talk about it, and it astounds me. Mm. The people that can think that things that Vice the hero, I, I agree with you that it's Rorschach, and that his integrity is what we strive for. And mm-hmm. uh, Vice does seem to have many parallels with Hitler. So. Mm. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the call. Right. Uh, that again opens up the uh, line six four six five nine five three one three five. Um, so here's the question uh, from the web chat, the uh, live web chat that accompanies the show. And by the way, there have been a lot of interesting comments. Uh, people uh, uh, love your accent. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> it, it's a cool accent, and I wish I had an accent. Uh, yeah. Little do they rubbish. know that this, as far as you're concerned, they do. I was going to say that, that rubbish always sounds better in a British accent, I find. <laughs> 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 or trash, um, as you call it. Uh, we've got yes, we've got no. I didn't say that. Um, no, I we've know. Got, uh, we've got. Uh, that's that's uh, just kind of British self-deprecation. <laughs> yeah, okay, uh, Kara. No, thank you. Uh, Joey, the artist, uh, says, "Can't wait to see Watchmen. Love the book." Uh, and then uh, here's a question from the NBA breakdown: uh, How do you think Watchmen is different from uh, other more commercial comics or characters? I guess uh, Batman. Superman, X-Men, Spider-Man. I I guess we're asking that have made the leap from uh, the comics page to uh, the screen. Uh, Well, I mean, I think the the key difference is that Watchmen is uh, is a story. It's a complete self-contained story that happens to feature, you know, costume characters, whereas, um, you know, the kind of Superman and Batman and and to a degree the kind of X-Men movies are just characters having adventures you know um and and those adventures aren't particularly um constrained in any way at all so the difficulty of making a superman movie i guess is how do you come up with the quintessential superman story that you know covers all the bases about superman that exploits superman's uh, um um attractive qualities whereas with watchmen really it's a question of you tell the story and the characters are just the players in the overriding story. Hmm. I I always thought it was very interesting about Watchmen the connection to the old Charlton characters, especially since uh, so few people saw those, and uh, then it, then you know they, they somewhat form the basis of this incredible uh, leap uh, that, that Watchmen is. Um, uh, we've got a couple other questions here that have come uh, from the. Uh, the web chat. Let's see. Um, I got to catch up here. They give us such a small window to look at this. Um, all right. Uh, let's see. Um, where is the question? Oh, did you catch the show uh, on? Okay. Uh, I hope this will make sense to you. Uh, okay. jo- Joey, the artist, says, "Did you catch the show I did on Watchmen and Vigilantism?" I don't believe I did. I mean, I've read a lot about Watchmen and Vigilantism, but I can't remember that specific uh, specific show. Okay. Or, I, and, the, and the name Joey the Artist rings no bells, I'm afraid, Joey. Uh, unless it's Jolt, I can't quite... Well, anyway, uh, uh, if you want to clarify that in the web chat, I'll be happy to come back to the question. Um, here's another one from Danger Girl. Yep. Do you know how much of David Hayter's script was used in the film? I read that the script... I read that script and thought it was the best interpretation of the book. Um, you know, I've read the David Hayter script, and I, I've read an early version of the, of the script for Watchmen, although it, it was, uh, you, you know, as Zach's making it, um, which is, hmm, I mean, that was different than the David Hayter script. The, the biggest change being, of course, that it was set in period. It was set in the mid-'80s rather than being updated to today. Um, there were also um, some changes to particularly Silk Spectre that I remember in the David Hayter script that was uh, excised in the later version. Um, but the version of the script that I read, um, 
that I got from Zach's office was a very early one in which the ending was completely different than the ending of Watchmen, the graphic novel, and, and subsequently the ending of the movie as it has been filmed. Um, so, um, I, you know, the the final version of, of, of the, the movie is different in many, many ways from David Hayter's script, but at the core of it is the mas- masterful boiling down of it that I think David Hayter did. Uh, I, I mean, Sam Hamm had written a script a long, long time ago, and I thought that was pr- pretty good, the way that he'd at least boiled everything down. But David Hayter, I felt, had done a wonderful job of stripping it all down and of compressing it and of combining things. Um, so I, I couldn't put a percentage on it. But, yeah, I, I mean, definitely the David Hayter script is the bedrock of what's ended up being filmed. Uh, and I'm very happy that it is. The uh, the visual of the of the trailer and the way the characters come to life. I mean, for example, and I I'm, I'm I've promised myself to stop beating on poor Frank Miller. Oh, poor Frank Miller! But <laughs> I mean, the spirit in the movie, the spirit really doesn't look anything like the character that that uh, our friend Will uh, designed. It's the, mm. the, the the it just doesn't. But when you see the trailer for Watchmen. They look pretty, I think, the characters as they come to life on screen, they look pretty true to what you drew 20, 23, 24 years ago. Oh, yeah. I mean, un- uncannily so. I mean, I- I- I've said in many places just how awestruck I was and how kind of dreamlike the whole thing was to be in the, you know, not only to see them on a screen flat projected on a on a movie screen, but actually to be in a room with them in their in in their sort of three dimensional bulk, you know, it, it, it was it was really strange to have have a guy to all in, who who to all intents and purposes is the comedian slap mm-hmm. you on the back and blow smoke on you, you know, is is very very strange. And I mean, you know, the costumes have been changed um, in, in in every case. There have been very few. Um, changes to the comedian's costume and even less to Rorschach. I mean, Night Owl looks quite a bit different, Silk Spectre, Ozymandias, but very much the way um, the the, um, costumes have been redesigned is is very much in keeping with the notion of it being a a deconstruction of superhero movies. And I think we see in the shot that's been around of the Minutemen, you know, the golden age precursors of the Crime Busters, you know, Watchmen characters, um, just what kind of cloth uniforms look like on screen. And they do look a little clunky, you know I mean? I think they look uh, uh, very sleek and very, very exciting, the uh, the costumes that they've ended up with in the, in, in the movie. So they still retain the spirit, and, and particularly the, I think the actors' um, performances are bang on to the characters the way that I imagined them, the way they move, the way they talk, the kind of range of emotions that, that they go for, uh, you know, over and above how they actually look um, in, in costume is um, it's just amazing and, you know, uh, makes me completely believe in them being the same characters. Mm. I love the, them. Uh... <laughs> it, it, it's, it's exciting. Now you mentioned seeing them in person and having a comedian slap you on the back and blow smoke in your face. So I have to ask you, uh, what sounds like you've spent some time on the set. Well, I spent some time, but not very much time. Um, I mean, I was I was asked to visit the set at, at I think a very carefully designed moment for me, which was um, you know what you could call the Crime Busters meeting. It's the scene in the book where. Uh, you know, they've got the map of the USA and, and they're sticking these um, labels on, you know, crime, unrest, you know. And the, the comedian is very dismissive of it all and sets fire to it with his Zippo lighter and, and strolls out the room, you know, much to everybody's upset. And, I mean, that was a great scene for me to see because it was all the characters there in costume. A lot of the other scenes would only have had some of the characters in costume, maybe none at all. So I was there for the particular couple of days that that was being filmed. Um, and, of course, I was also taken to see the, the static sets as well, you know, like the like Karnak and Dan Dryberg's Brownstone and very notably the, the Owl Ship as well, which is, uh, mm. you know, um, just an incredibly... Uh, um, uh, well, it's just, an, just a, 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 again... A, 
I, I, I had to keep coming back to the same words. I had to keep saying dreamlike and out of body experience and stuff like that because to actually encounter the, the owl ship as I imagined it and to stand inside it and play with all the controls, you know, <laughs> is, is, is very, very dreamlike and, 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 um, and strange. So, yeah, I, I mean, I was only there for a couple of days, um, uh, but I think they were a crucial couple of days, and I think as much as as I got from it, I did get the idea as well that uh, everybody seems <laughs> so pleased to see me, and 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 you know, I, I mean, um, it seems so happy to have my approval as well. Uh, I mean, I guess they've sunk so much time in it that if I'd come along and, and scowled, you know, uh, it would have been <laughs> rather heartbreaking for them. But I was very happy to smile because I was absolutely thrilled with what I saw and heard. Mm. I uh, in the opening to uh, Mr. Media, I always uh, say that uh, it's somewhat tongue in cheek that uh, the show is coming to you from the new media and baseball. I know baseball doesn't mean much to you there, but baseball capital of St. Petersburg, Florida. But there's a connection here to Watchmen that I want to point out. People okay. won't know or care, but Patrick Wilson, who plays uh, Night Owl Two, uh, is from St. Petersburg, Florida, and uh, actually his, his school. He graduated from the school that my daughter now goes to, and uh, their big claim to fame at that school is Patrick Wilson. So I, I, I suspect that I suspect that come March, when uh, 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 the movie hopefully will open, I will change the opening on the Mr. Media Show to say the home of <laughs> Night Owl Night Owl, yeah. <laughs> Night Owl, yeah. So yeah, uh, <laughs> no, no. I mean, he, I mean, as with the other actors, he, he, he gives a great performance, Patrick Wilson. I mean, I think anybody who's seen the bits of, of footage that have been out so far. Uh, uh, can tell that he absolutely, um, you know, is Dan Dryberg. He is that beaten, out of condition guy. But magically, he is also that very potent, very, uh, very capable crime fighter as well. So he he, he does a, a a really wonderful trick of playing both those parts. I think. Yeah, it'd be nice for Patrick to be in something that is not a chick flick, is from my perspective. <laughs> um, I want to say, I want to make a correction earlier. I mispronounced the name of someone in the web chat. It was not uh, Joey the artist, it was Joy the artist, and her comment was actually to someone else about the documentary, it was to someone else uh, in the chat. However, I will quote her uh, yeah. right now saying that shot on the trailer where the owl ship rises from the water gives mm. me chills so good. So. Well, can you imagine what it does to me? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just... It, uh, you know, it is the way I saw it. You know, there is no, no, other, there's nothing else to say. That is the shot. You know, that is what it should have been. You know, Dave, have you seen more of the finished uh, film than than the trailer that we've all seen? Um, yeah, I mean, I have seen a, a rough cut of the of the entire thing. Um, um, a week after Comic Con in the summer, um, um, I I saw. Um, you know, a kind of, I think it was about two and two and three quarter hour uh, cut of it, which was quite unfinished. It didn't have, obviously, final music on it. And a lot of the shots of Dr. Manhattan had him in his uh, in his kind of Tron suit. But nevertheless, I mean, it, it, it was just uh, an incredible experience. And um, I think a thrilling movie and a very unusual movie. Um, it, it, it's it's got a structure and it's got a kind of a sweep about it that I think um, very few movies have, particularly very few superhero movies, because it does range over, you know, characters' lives uh, and, you know, many, many decades of, of time and some settings from, you know, as I say, New York brownstones to Mars to Antarctica to, you know, uh, it just... Uh, it, it, it's a film with huge sweep and, a, and an incredible kaleidoscope of uh, event and character and uh, action and, and emotion. Hmm. Now, after after all these years and, and no doubt uh, uh, a few options payments over the years, do you and, and Alan, for that matter, still have a, a vested financial stake in the success or failure of uh, Watchmen as a film? Well, as you know, Alan, um, as part of his not wanting anything to do with the movie at all, um, wanted me to have his his share of the movie money, um, which isn't as straightforward a thing as you as you might think, and it isn't without its ramifications. But that's what he wanted anyway. Um, I rather suspect that uh, again, with I think wonderful kind of irony in a way. Perhaps irony isn't quite the word, but. 
uh, the, the thing that I, I think will happen is that um, we'll probably, you know, I don't really need to discuss my personal finances on the on the no. on the internet, but I guess people can work it out for themselves anyway. That you know, many many hundreds of thousands of copies of, of the book uh, are going to be sold as a result of the movie, and there was a huge upsurge in sales anyway back in the summer, um, mm. and of course Alan. Um, does still get royalties from that so i think that's uh, a rather uh, wonderful spin-off of it that you know not only will uh, he make some money from that as will i but that also many more people will read the original graphic novel and experience um alan's work and my work firsthand and hopefully be um you know tempted to search further and um you know um read some of, of alan's alan's other wonderful works mm. Um, we're heading into the last uh, segment here, so folks, if you if you're listening to us live and you'd like to get in a question, you can call us six four six five nine five three one three five or uh, submit a question on the live web chat that accompanies every live Mr. Media interview. Um, uh, we may run, uh, and folks, if you're listening to us on the live feed, if we run over the top of the hour, you'll be able you won't be able to hear us on on the streaming feed, but you, uh, you will hear the show in its entirety uh, on the archive later. So just so you know, because sometimes I have a habit of running long. Um, I want to combine a question from the web chat with one of my own. Uh, NBA Breakdown is wondering what your overall impression of comic movies today would be, and I'm also wondering, because this leads into something else, if you got to see the Spirit uh, movie. Well, uh, you know, I think the latest crop of superhero movies, it, 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 you know, are by and large doing the right thing in that they are going back to the essence of the characters, you know. Um, I mean, I've, I've been particularly impressed by the Spider-Man movies, which to me, you know, capture very much the kind of mood and atmosphere of of what Stanley and Steve Ditko did w- w- way back when. And, and I think the, the the more accurate they are and the closer they, they, they go to that template, which has lasted all, all these decades, mm. the better the films are and the more comprehensible they are. Because, you know, all the great comic book characters have got pretty elementary, have got a pretty elementary basis. You know, S- Superman the Orphan, who's trying to do the right thing, Batman the Orphan is also trying to do the right thing, but in a slightly more wrong way. Um, you know, um, uh, Iron Man, you know, the kind of drunk who, who um, has, to, has to put on a suit to save his life and then, you know, it becomes like a kind of, kind of sentient weapon. I mean, I mean, to me, these things are the absolute essence of the characters. And I think, I think also the fact that the, the effects um, are capable of of being uh, completely believable nowadays makes a huge difference as well. You know, it has got to the point where anything you can imagine, you can make appear to be real, and I think that very much works in in uh, Watchmen's favour as well. That you know, it has to look like a real world where these people really exist, not a kind of this world where it all looks faked up. So um, I think that's that's had a, a huge. Um, uh, that you know, just the special effects have, have had a huge um, um, impact on superhero movies, and I suppose the fact also that the audience has been softened up by the kind of you know Bruce Willis, Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of action movies of of the 90s, which were really you know superhero movies in in in, in mm-hmm. everything but name. Uh, so I think you know to me the time now feels very ripe for superhero movies, and also I think the fact that with Batman and Dark Knight and hopefully. Well, I'm sure with with Watchmen, we're going to move beyond the more obvious way of doing superheroes. Um, you know, I think that bodes well for the future as well. Not that I want everything to be grim and gritty. You know, I don't want us to be condemned to de- to a decade of grim and gritty superhero movies like we were condemned to a decade of grim and gritty superhero comic books. Mm-hmm. You know, but I, I I would I would like to to think that the movies will also be able to broaden out um, superhero movies into into all they can be, from grim and gritty to charming to magical, you know? Hmm. Now, you didn't answer the question about the spirit, which is okay, but I'll, oh, let me ask well, you. Uh, no, I'm, I'm happy to answer that question. I, Have you seen I, it? I, I, I haven't seen the spirit movie, no. Ah. 
All right. Well, let me let me ask you this about about that. Uh, you and Alan uh, Moore, and this is where we go back. Have your own connection to the spirit. Uh, the first project that you and Alan did together after Watchmen was an issue of the New Adventures of the Spirit for Kitchen Sink. Yeah. Uh, you guys managed to keep the spirit of the spirit. Uh, could you share with uh, listeners the story you told me about the caveat uh, that Will uh, Eisner had asked you to pass along to Alan uh, after I think after Comic Con? Well, yeah, I, I mean, um, you know, Alan and I were, were thrilled that we'd been asked to kick off this new uh, run of the Spirit, where Will had finally um, agreed to let um, you know contemporary creators. Um, have a go at his his character. I mean, we were thrilled to be able to do it, and also intimidated. I mean, you know, <laughs> as I've said elsewhere, there, you know, there are many masters of, of comic books, but Will had to be the grandmaster. Um, and I remember he wanted to talk to me uh, when I was at the Comic Con in San Diego, and he he took me for a coffee and sat me down and seemed very uh, concerned and very, you know, like he had to say something to me, and and you know, didn't want to upset me and. and so he, you know, we spoke briefly um, about what, what Alan and I proposed, and he said, "Well, that, well, that sounds good, Dave. But there's one thing you, you've got to promise me." He said, "Whatever you do, please don't make the spirit into a junkie." <laughs> <laughs> the last thing in the world that that that, that we would have thought of doing would be to turn Danny Colt into a junkie. I mean, I don't know if perhaps Will had an idea that. You know, maybe he'd seen a picture of Alan and thought, oh, no, you know, this is... And or perhaps it was Will's experience of underground comics where no doubt he met people who either were or who had a great fondness or, or for uh, junkies. But um, certainly you know, it was nothing we would ever have wanted to do with the spirit. And, and as far as we were concerned, I mean, I, I, in a strange way to link it to the, the last question or, or whatever, Alan and I knew that what we needed to do was to get as close to the true spirit of the spirit, as you so mm. aptly put it, as we possibly could, um, and to keep him in that kind of timeless spirit zone, you know, not the modern world, not try and be very contemporary with him, but keep him as a character of, of myth uh, and have him in those kind of timeless O. Henry kind of um, fables, you know, almost like e Aesop's fables or, 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 or things where the, the point of the story wasn't the spirit. It was just something that the spirit was, was witnessing or had a walk on part in, you know. So that was that was the take that we we had on the spirit, not to make him into a, a 21st century junkie. It's funny, in retrospect, that that was Will's concern, and it, it would have never occurred to Will that he, would, he should have... Uh, uh, put out there the warning to anyone who would uh, handle the spirit in years to come, not to make him, uh, uh, well, what's the word I'm looking for? Not to make him a character who, you know, was impervious to bullets and was some kind of, you know, Superman type character, which I, I think is one of the things that may have gone wrong in the uh, in the new movie. Um, well, I mean, I mean, I think the, the spirit has always had an incredible capacity for for taking punishment. You know, I mean, right. he's always getting getting pushed down stairs and set fire to and beaten up and hit hit with with iron bars and things like that. I mean, as I say, not having seen the movie, I'm not quite sure uh, how how uh, w w what levels of vulnerability he's uh, reached, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, as I say, I, I I haven't seen it, so I'm, I'm reluctant to comment further. The bit, the bit I really liked in the trailer, you know, in the first trailer, was where he slips on the roof. I thought that was exactly right, and uh, mm. I know that was one of Frank's favourite bits as well, so uh, that's all I can tell you. Well, in terms of, uh, I, I want to move on from this in a second, but in terms of the spirit's ability to take punishment, uh, I'm looking at uh, my 8-inch uh, uh, spirit action figure, that uh, my daughter, who is now 12, is still loves to tie up, and she's got him <laughs> gagged with uh, uh, scotch tape around the mouth and bound his arms to his body with uh, uh, rubber bands. His feet are bound together and his arms. And, you know, I, just, <laughs> I don't know what it is about that character in women, but um, briefly, tell us what's happening with uh, Mark Washington. <laughs> uh, that, was a, that was a big announcement uh, just days before... Uh, I don't know if there's so much an announcement, but there was no. a story uh, that you were interested I, I, in working with Frank. Yeah, I, I, I 
don't think it was a big announcement of, of any sort at all. I think somewhere along the way, um, I'd been asked, you know, are, are there any other things you've worked on that you think, you know, would could be made into movies? And uh, I mentioned Martha Washington, and and you know, uh, um, added that you know Frank was, uh, you, you know, had a position in in Hollywood now, and that oh, yeah, no, maybe we'll make a Martha Washington movie. But I, I certainly wasn't making an, a. a big announcement on behind, behalf of Frank and myself. You know, I mean, it's a thing that I think pretty clearly would be on the cards, and it's a thing that I think in a, uh, a completely unrelated interview Frank has touched on as well. But we, we haven't as yet had serious discussions about it. The thing that, that is happening with Martha is that we're finally collecting all her comic book appearances together. And, you know, it's strange because it's a thing that Frank and I have done sporadically over the past couple of decades, and it now adds up to you know, more than 500, probably almost getting on for 600 pages of uh, of uh, art, uh, which is kind of almost twice as big as Watchmen. So it's a considerable body of work. Um, and, um, you know, that's going to be collected together in, in an oversized, you know, absolute type um, hardcover. So um, we'll then be in a position to say, you know, this is the story of Martha Washington. And uh, I think um, anything movie related would be, taken from there but um you know frank is very much um, our point man in uh, hollywood so um to a degree i'll be i'll be guided by his uh, his feelings on it uh as we kind of wind up here two last questions and i'll remind people listening to the uh live uh, stream that uh the stream will cut off in a moment uh but uh you will be able to listen to the interview in its entirety uh, a few minutes after it ends um all the attention in 2009 will doubtless be on Watchmen, uh, a project that is more than two decades old. Did you ever dream its impact would be so enduring and, as we've kind of discussed, profitable? Um, no. I mean, you know, when we did the comic book, there really weren't such things as uh, graphic novels. And, uh, you know, we really did think that we'd do the 12 issues of the comic book and that would be it and it would go into the back issue bins and, and it would all finish. I mean... Um, Alan, in particular, uh, was was confident that you know it would go out of print, and two years later or three years later, whatever the contract said, you know that we would get all the rights back. Well, that didn't ever happen, and the fact of the matter is, it hasn't been out of print in the past 22 years, um, and I don't think it, you know we foresaw that, and so, well, we definitely didn't foresee that because we didn't foresee the graphic novel, and I think even had DC foreseen the graphic novel. I think that was a level of success that even they wouldn't have uh, bet on. Um, um, so, yeah, and the, the fact that it's eventually being made into a movie, although, you know, that was nothing that particularly concerned us. You know, it was really, that felt just like having a ticket in a lottery somewhere that might win, you know, that you had in the, in the back of your wallet, and if it won, well, great, but you might not win the first prize, you know, or it might never come up at all. So... Um, we certainly weren't ever looking forward to the day when it would be um, a, a big Hollywood movie. So, uh, you know, you never can tell how things are going to work out. <laughs> and, Dave, the uh, payoff for people who uh, may have caught the live show but are now going to go back and listen to it again to see how we wound up, uh, what are you working on these days that is not Watchmen related? What, you know, <laughs> what, what are you doing at your, at your drawing board? Well, I mean, because, uh, you know, Watchmen is now, you know, working up into a frenzy, um, really for the past mm, three or four months, I haven't done anything other than uh, promote Watchmen and promote my book. And before that, I was writing the Watching the Watchmen book. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm consulting on things like the, the Motion comic, which uh, is available on uh, on iTunes and um, on the computer game as well. Um, so one way and another, Watchmen is taking up most of my time. I've also done um, licensing artwork for it as well, which I think is also beginning to um, appear. Um, I did find time to write one short little script for um, Hellblazer, who's a character that I haven't worked very much on, but who I, who I do have a certain fondness to. And, of course, um, he's an Alan Moore creation as well from way back when. Um, and I am working on another project for DC, which, you know, I'm going to have to be all coy and, and not tell you exactly what it is, but it is something uh, a little unusual and something that I'm quite excited about and something which 
uh, pays homage to another one of my comic book um, idols and influences. Um, and then a bit, and then as I say, there is the Martha Washington book that I've I've written some uh, introductions for and done a new cover for. Um, and then further down the line, probably in the later half, the latter half of next year, um, I have got um, a, a, a creator own project that I'm doing with a writer who I haven't worked with before, but who is extremely well known. Um, uh, that um, I, again, I really can't say too much about because it's not <laughs> just mine to talk about. But yeah, so I think the answer is uh, it's Watchman, 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 and then I'll be getting back to some uh, honest work um, about the middle of next year, hopefully. Uh, it's listen. It's uh, as as someone who relies on uh, book sales, uh, it's not a bad thing to enjoy some some uh, leftover profit from. Uh, book that you, you've done years ago. That's one of the nice things about our industry when it works. You get those royalties. and uh, uh, That's a good thing. Um, good. Yes, well, I um, think so too. <laughs> I, knew you, I didn't think you'd disagree. Uh, Alan may well, not need the money, but the rest of us working folks will take it. Well, yeah, that's, that, that's true. No, I mean, my, my attitude very much towards this is that no, I'll just, I just give you Another quick anecdote. I happened to talk to uh, Mike Mignola, who's somebody I, has been a friend of mine for a, a long time, and this was before the Watchmen thing really got going. And I, I said, you know, Mike, you've, you've just come off the kind of Hellboy experience. You know, could you mark my card? Could you tell me, you know, what to expect? And Mike said, well, he said, probably at the end of the day, there won't be a lot of money left from the movie, which mm. is even more true in the case of Watchmen than in Hellboy. I'm sure, and uh, he said, but along the way, he said, you'll have, a, you'll have a great time, you'll meet some great people, you'll have some nice travel, you'll stay in some nice hotels, make the best of it, and really, that's what I'm doing, you know, it's a bit like the circus is in town, and I'm really enjoying it, and I'm having a good time, and the circus will eventually move, move on, but um, I think by then, uh, maybe uh, I'll have had enough of circuses, or maybe not, but um, yeah, as I say, I'm really just enjoying the experience while it lasts. That's great. That's great. Well, uh, folks, if you're a fan of the original graphic novel, Watchmen, by yeah. Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons, or as the credit reads now, by Dave Gibbons, um, <laughs> you'll, <laughs> you'll love Dave's new exploration of the making of that project. Again, it's called Watching the Watchmen from Titan Books. You can find it at fine bookstores all over the world, I'm sure, or order it online at Amazon.com or MR Media, MrMedia.com. And watch for the Watchmen movie this spring, we hope from either Warner Brothers or Fox. Uh, Dave, uh, it's always a pleasure. I, I don't want to wait four years uh, to have another conversation. But, okay, well, uh, let's, I, I enjoyed it very much indeed, Bob. Let's do it again soon. Let's go two years this time. Okay. <laughs> All right. Listen, much good luck on, on everything, and uh, thanks, ha- ha- a, a, a wonderful uh, Happy New Year to you. And thanks. Okay, so much and the time. very same to you and all your listeners as well. All right. Thank you, Dave. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. And folks, uh, for dozens more comic book creator interviews, uh, you can surf over to our main website, www.mrmedia.com, where you can listen to my earlier conversations with Gene Colan, uh, Darwin Cook, Wendy Peeney, Joe Sinnott, uh, Chuck Dixon, Danny Fingeroth, Peter Cooper, Trina Robbins, Drew Friedman, and many more. And please think about writing an online review of Mr. Media, casting a vote for Mr. Media, or marking Mr. Media as one of your favorites, whether you listen on Blog Talk Radio, Digital Journal, Podcast Pickle, Pointer Online, Vox, Folio, Mediafly, Podfeed.net, Blueberry, Zenco, Zencast, Odeo, or iTunes. If you've got an idea for a guest, email me directly at bob at andelman, A-N-D-E-L-M-A-N dot com. You can also follow me at Twitter, www.twitter.com backslash andelman, A-N-D-E-L-M-A-N. Thanks again so much for uh, joining us today. I always appreciate when you give up a little piece of your day to spend it with good old Mr. Media. Come back and see us real soon.